Nearly 700 years ago, it was just common knowledge that Moses wrote the Torah. Everyone studying the Bible knew it. Moses wrote every word of the book, and scribes had passed it down perfectly. Even as far back as the first century, Josephus claims in Against Appian that there is no discrepancy in what is written when referring to the Jewish canon. There were, after all, plenty of places in the Torah in which Moses can be seen writing, and many more places that refer to the Book of the Law of Moses. Eventually, however, problems began to arise, and this perfect view of a Torah written by Moses would soon fall apart. So today, we will be exploring the claim that Moses wrote the Torah. In Jewish tradition, when the Torah is raised, the phrase, This is the Torah that Moses set before the people of Israel, by the mouth of God, through the hand of Moses, is spoken. The reason for this is a combination of two verses that, together, show that Moses did, in fact, write the Torah. Deuteronomy 4.44, This is the law Moses set before the Israelites, and Numbers 9.23, At the commandment of the Lord they rested in the tents, and at the commandment of the Lord they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Of course, not the entire Torah could be from the hand of Moses, though. And even the most fundamentalist believers realize this. The last eight verses of Deuteronomy 34, which feature the death and burial of Moses, certainly couldn't be from Moses himself. So traditionally, the whole Torah is written by Moses except the last eight verses. Most rabbis think that the last eight verses were written by Joshua, the son of Nun, and the successor of Moses. An alternative explanation was that Moses wrote it down in tears while receiving this information from God. But that view is much less popular. Mosaic authorship is usually defended on the grounds of just a few verses. The book of Exodus explicitly claims Mosaic authorship when God commanded Moses to write the events of Joshua's military encounter with the Amalekites in Exodus 17:14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. In Exodus 24, Moses told the people God's laws, and they shouted, Everything the Lord has said we will do. We are then told, Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. Just a few verses later, Moses took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They replied, saying, We will do everything the Lord has said. Even outside of Exodus, there are verses supporting the traditional view of Mosaic authorship. According to Deuteronomy 31.9, Moses wrote down this law for the priests. Deuteronomy 31.24 states that Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end. It seems the conclusion is undeniable. The authorial claim of the Torah is that it is from the hand of Moses. Why then do most scholars today not accept Mosaic authorship? Over time, the consensus shifted from Mosaic authorship to the view that the Torah is a composite work written by many authors over many years. Some of the authors took from many sources. The Torah itself even lists some of its sources. For example, Genesis 5.1, this is the scroll of the generations of Adam. The scroll itself may have come from a book of generations, which held the genealogies of the ancestors of Israel. Other genealogies in the Torah may have been copied from this source. There also may have been a scroll containing accounts of the wars, as indicated by Numbers 21.14, when Moses introduces a poem. That is why the Book of the Wars of the Lord says, The journey to where we are now begins in the 11th century, when Isaac ibn Yashish noticed that the list of Edomite kings in Genesis 36 included kings that existed after the life of Moses. This meant Moses would have no way of putting them into his list of Edomite kings. Following this line of thought, Ibn Yashish reasoned that this section could not have been written by Moses, making this a later addition. For example, the Hadad of Genesis 36-35 would be identical to Hadad the Edomite in 1 Kings 11-14, and Meedabel from Genesis 36-39 would be the sister of Taphanes of 1 Kings 11-19. Moses would have no access to this information. The response was exactly what you'd expect. People mocked him and ignored his very real concern. Ibn Yashish suggested that these verses were put in at a later time, and for this he was called a blunderer. The person who gave him that wonderful nickname would be a founding father in this non-Mosaic authorship view, however. It was Abraham Ibn Ezra. He wrote detailed commentaries on the Bible. 
Abraham Ibn Ezra was actually the first one to suggest the death scene of Moses was not written by Moses, and proposed that it was Joshua who authored the text. There was one major problem with Ibn Ezra's view, however. The writing style of the narrative matched the writing style of the verses preceding it, meaning it was written by the same person. Ibn Ezra did see the problems with Mosaic authorship in the traditional view, but told people not to speak on it and keep silent. A later 14th century scholar, Yosef Bonfils, didn't take Ibn Ezra's advice and noted some key passages that posed problems with Mosaic authorship. These were the verses Ibn Ezra suggested people keep silent about. He mentioned six verses, but I will only point out two of them for the sake of brevity. Og, king of Bashan, was the last of the Rephaites. His bed was decorated with iron and more than nine cubits long and four cubits wide. It is still in Rabbah of the Ammonites. Deuteronomy 3.11 Here we are told about the bed of King Og. If the author was Moses, he could not have known about Og's bed, since the city would have only been taken during the reign of David, a king who would have lived centuries after the death of Moses. Deuteronomy 1.1 tells us that God spoke to Moses across the Jordan. This implies that the writer wrote from the eastern side of the Jordan, a place Moses was never allowed to go. The verse, then, would have been written by someone in Israel, on the west side of the Jordan, referring to what Moses did on the east side of the Jordan. Evidence against Mosaic authorship kept being piled on until the 17th century. It was only after about 500 years of investigation that people began to accept that the majority of the Torah was not written by Moses. There were many things that simply made Mosaic authorship implausible or impossible. The Jews and Christians still held to the traditional view for a long time, however. It was only in the 19th century that the tables finally turned. Enter Julius Wellhausen. He is known as one of the originators of the documentary hypothesis. He took all the evidence discussed, along with the different names used for God in the Torah, and came up with something very revolutionary. Keep in mind what follows is a brief overview. He noticed that Deuteronomy shared many similar themes and language with the next six books that followed, excluding Ruth, the Deuteronomistic history. He also noted that the history seemed to be split in two, Sometimes the text would say something would last forever and later clarify it as conditional. This led to his thought that there were two versions of this history, DTR1 and DTR2, as they were labeled. He also split the authorship of the rest of the Torah into three different authors, J, E, and P, a Yahwist, a Loist, and priestly source, none of which, he argued, were written by Moses. This view would be the consensus for the next century, but it has lost a lot of traction over the last few decades. In those decades, there have been many other proposed ideas, many of which are incredibly nuanced. Perhaps I'll make a video in the future delving deeper into the topic, but the validity of the documentary hypothesis is not important to this video. Today, we are only exploring whether or not Moses wrote the Torah. There are many other things that simply make Mosaic authorship impossible. Certain parts of the Torah use words for places and things that are different from other parts. For instance, some stories used Horeb as the name of the mountain where Moses receives the law, while other parts of the story use the name Sinai. Some stories throughout use the name Amorites for the original dwellers of Canaan, while others use the word Canaanites. Moses' father-in-law is named as Jethro in most stories, but in others he is named Ruel. These contradictions and linguistic anomalies aren't all, though. Numbers 34 speaks of the boundaries to be set in the Promised Land. Most of the areas listed are things Moses would not have known about. Of course, this can be thrown away because it was the words God was speaking to Moses. But that's not how history is done. Historians can't access revelatory or miracle claims. From the view of history, Moses could not have known the names of these places. Statements such as, before any king ruled over the Israelites, in Genesis 36-31, implies a time in the writer's mind when kings had ruled over the Israelites, but none ever did in Moses' lifetime. The text says, at that time the Canaanites were in the land, in Genesis 12-6, which implies the author was writing in a time when they weren't there anymore. But the Canaanites were obviously still there when Joshua led his conquest, and that was after the death of Moses. There's a good reason scholars no longer hold to the view that Moses wrote the Torah. After so many centuries of problematic passages being pointed out, and so many centuries of excommunication and mockery, the view finally dropped away from the mainstream. The problems were simply too numerous to keep ignoring. Moses didn't write the Torah. 
In fact, modern scholars don't even think Moses existed at all. Over the course of a millennium, scholars have went from Moses wrote the entire Torah to Moses probably didn't exist at all. Thanks for watching. If you haven't yet, be sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoy our content and want to help support this channel, check out our Patreon and Teespring links in the description. If you don't want to spend money but still see what we're doing outside of YouTube, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Also make sure to check out our website, milwaukeeatheists.com. We'll see you next time. Thank you.